I see their print on every face in the streets of London. I'm sorry you should know they say Fremont or whatever his name may be. I believe there is contamination in such a scoundrel. You should know my present name is changed. It is not my own. I wish to tell you what it is and why I am in England. The 105 North Tower, 100 Shoes. A lady's walking shoe. I must finish. I called in my sleep. Where is he? No answer. I demand of heaven that he will come. No answer. I send my desolate cry across the sea. I hope for her sake, destiny will keep her husband, Dane, out of France. I have them husband, wife, father, knitted in the register. It was decided. Extermination. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Episode 6, The Track of a Storm. Hold still, damn you! Hold still! Hold still, damn you! Bad roads, bad carriages, bad horses and dangerous times. France with a king, without a king, without glory. Name and papers! Damn you, give us your name and papers! Comers and goers stopped, questioned, cross-questioned. Papers inspected, checked, names on lists. Stop, hold them, send them back. As fancy deemed best for the dawning republic. I must reach Paris, find Gabelle. He called out for me. Where from, citizen? Calais. Before? London, England. All the time I ride towards Paris, I hear the barricades close shut behind me, barring me from England and my love, my child. Before! I know I ride into the net, but honor, duty. From beyond Beauvais. Oh, indeed. Here, he's come home to his mother. Here, citizen soldiers. Here's an immigrant. Down with him, <laughs> bastard. No, sir. No bastard, sir. We says bastard. You are a bastard, eh, me? Twenty times a day. Call me back, take me back. Questions, questions, answers. Suspicion lies over the land. See me, friend! See my sword! See your guts, eh? Oh, back! His papers are in order! Only the letter from Gabelle opens doors, clears the way. Hang the pig! For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honor of your noble name, succor and release me. I have been true to you. Release me. I came back of my own free will to help an old family friend. I have no choice. Aristo! No, sir. Citizen. No, sir, sir. I beg your pardon. You will. You get to Paris and you'll kiss the basket, citizen. <laughs> <laughs> An escort will take him. An escort? To Paris! I want nothing better than to get to Paris. Oh, I hope you says the same when you get there, citizen. <laughs> make way, make way for a prisoner. I am not a prisoner. You watch. We say you are, citizen. Papers? Yeah. yeah and who is he? Traitor. Emigrant, come back. Come back, you come back. I have a duty to a friend. More for you, then. I tell you... Since the decree makes you a traitor, you are one, friend. What decree? A decree for selling the property of emigrants. When passed? The 14th. The day I left England. Uh, you can leave him here, citizen. We'll take him. Come on, you! <coughs> the guardroom smells of cheap wine and tobacco. Soldiers asleep or drunk lie about the corridor and in the room itself. The light in the room is part from the overcast day and half from the waning oil lamps of the night. Registers lie open on the desk and an officer of coarse, dark aspect presides over them. Your age, Evermond? 37. Married, Evermond? Yes. Where married? In England. Where is your wife, Evermond? In England. You are consigned to the prison law force. Prison? Under what law? For what offence? We have new laws, Evermond, and new offences since you were here. I came here voluntarily. I came in response to that appeal you have before you, from a fellow countryman. I demand no more than demand, an opportunity... Demand, Evermond, demand. I have a right to go to the help of a fellow countryman. Right. 
Emigrants have no rights, Evermont. Citizen Defarge, take this warrant and the prisoner. Oh. In secret. You understand me? No one noticed us. We walked through the streets. Even the children didn't turn to see us go by. A man spat. A woman turned her head away. It was as if... as if there was nothing remarkable in a man in good clothes going to prison between an escort. Is he one of us? No! We heard a man haranguing a small mob of men no. and women. Is Madame Capet one of us? No! no. Does Madame Capet suffer? No! Are they ever hungry? Do their children cry in the night from empty bellies? Only now, only now, when they are dragged from their coats, dragged from their thrones, dragged from their palaces, do they know hunger, fear the Cold War? I say they pay the price for every child of ours who died, for every friend of ours who was killed, for every man and woman imprisoned by them, walled up. Kings and queens are awful! On your way! Come on, come on! In the name of that sharp woman, La Guillotine, why? Why did you come back to France? Do you not believe the truth? A man called for help. Bad luck to you, then. You should have stayed away. Will you give me a little help? None. In this prison I am going to. Will I have some communication with the outside? You will say. I am not going to be buried there, prejudged. No means of presenting my case. You will see. But what then? Other people have been buried that way in worse prisons before now. But never by me, citizen Zafarge. It is important, very important to me, that a Mr. Lorry of Telson's Bank, an English gentleman now in Paris, should know where I am. That I have been thrown into the prison of La Force. Will you cause that to be done for me? My duty is to my country and to the people. I am a sworn servant of both against you. I will do nothing for you. Fear, horror, emotion, imagination, bad business. Telson's Bank, London, depends on me. Here, in Paris, men cut throats in the name of liberty. Women watch the executioners work in the name of equality. They all sharpen their knives, their bayonets, their reaping hooks, and go looking for blood, for revenge. Here, in the courtyard of Tilson's house in Paris, a huge grindstone, a cupid whitewashed over the counter in the banking house, sees all. Business. What money left? Who left to withdraw it? Which depositors rusting in prisons? Which deposits never to be balanced for lack of a depositor? Save in the next world. I sit in my rooms in the bank and look out across the courtyard where two flambeaux light that huge grindstone. The fearful mob waving bloody arms and bloodier blades and crying for more, more. Thank God that no one near and dear to me is in this dreadful city tonight. May he have mercy on all who are in danger. Sign for him. Here, take the paper for what it's worth, citizen. You, what's your name? Evrimond. Yes. With me. Already full to burst in... Come on, then. Don't stand there. Through the dismal prison twilight, corridor by corridor, staircase by staircase, past doors and gates, clanging and locking, through long chambers and full cells, past waving arms and sobs and cries, into a low vaulted chamber, crowded with prisoners of both sexes. The men, for the most part standing, strangely clouded by prison gloom, spectral as though, as though the company of the dead, ghosts, the ghost of beauty, the ghost of frivolity, the ghost of wit, the ghost of youth, the ghost of age, all waiting their dismissal from the desolate shore. 
all watching with eyes changed by the death they had died in coming here. Sir, in the name of the assembled companions in misfortune, I have the honor of giving you welcome to La Force and of condoling with you on the calamity that has brought you among us. It would be an impertinence elsewhere, but it is not so here. May I ask your name and condition? Everyman. A prisoner, it seems. I hope... I hope you are not in secret. I do not understand the meaning of the term, but I have heard them say so. Oh, what a pity. <coughs> what a pity. In secret. Oh, what a pity. How still it is. And across the city, the terrible hum, a, a sort of ring about it. Dreadful, dreadful town. Jarvis Lorry, no imagination. No imagination. Business. And sleep. What? Oh, Mr. Lorry, sir! What's it news? You in there, sir? Hmm? Oh, sir! Oh, Jerry! Yeah, Mr. Lorry, sir! Jerry! Jerry, what is this? What? Oh. oh. Lucy! Oh, Mr. Lorry. Oh, Mr. Lorry, what a terrible, terrible time. Oh, yeah. Father, we're safe. Oh, thank God. Oh. Our bags. Just a minute. Mr. Cruncher, <laughs> our bags. They come to the door in a coach, Mr. Mm. Lorry, sir. Mm. Ask for you. I hope I've done the right thing in bringing them to you, Mr. Oh. Lorry, sir. Uh, I beg your pardon, sir, but I'll, I'll just wait down there on the step and yes. keep a watching eye as you ask. Yes. It's been a bad time, sir. What he bad? And my dear friend, we had to come. Mr. Lorry. Come. Come up to my rooms. Come. Miss Pross. Lucy. Lucy, what has happened? Manette, what has brought you here? Uh, my husband. Uh, Charles? What of it? Charles is here in Paris. Uh, what? An errand of generosity brought him here, unknown to us. But he was stopped at the barry and was sent to prison. Uh, what is that noise? It's in your courtyard, Lord. Uh, don't, don't touch the blind. For your life, Manette. Don't. Oh, my dear friend, I have a charmed life in this city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is no patriot in Paris, in France, who, knowing me to have been a prisoner in the Bastille, would touch me, save to overwhelm me with embraces or to carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me such power it has brought us through every barrier, gained us news of Charles, brought us here. I, I knew, I knew it would be so. I told Lucy so. I can help Charles. Now, what is that not? Oh, please, don't look. Please, Hudson. No, Lucy, please don't. Don't be afraid, but please don't look. Where is Charles? I've heard nothing. Which prison? La Force. La Force. Lucy, if ever you were brave, child, compose yourself and do exactly as I ask you. More depends on it than I can say. I must bid you do the hardest thing of all for Charles's sake. You must instantly be obedient, still and quiet. You must let me put you in a back room. Leave your father and me alone for two minutes, and as there are life and death in the world, you must do it now. Whatever you say, Mr. Lorry. Miss Bross, go with her, please. Very good, Mr. Lorry. Now can I look? We'll turn out the lamp first, that they don't see us watching. My God, my God. In the courtyard, 40, 50 people, no more. Such awful workers and such awful work. The grindstone has a double handle, two men turning it madly. Faces turned up by the grinding, savage, cruel, hideous with blood and sweat, wild and staring with beastly excitement and lack of sleep. Matted locks flung forward over their eyes and back over their necks. Women hold wine to their mouths that they might drink, but what with dropping blood and dropping wine and what with the stream of sparks struck out of the stone, all their wicked atmosphere seemed gore and fire. Shouldering one another to get closer to the sharpening stone, men stripped to the waist with blood all over their limbs and bodies, men in stained rags, men devilishly set off with bits of women's lace and silk and ribbons with the stain dyeing those trifles. 
Hatchets, knives, bayonets, swords red with blood. Their eyes red. Eyes which any unbrutalized beholder would have given 20 years of life to petrify with a well-directed gun. My God, every night they come and then go to the prisons and kill, 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 night after night. Oh, Manette, if you are sure, if you are certain of what you say, if you really have the power, make yourself known to those devils and get taken to La Force. It may be too late, I don't know, but let it not be a minute later. I will find apartments for Lucy. My man Cruncher will see to her and Miss Pross. I will do it. Look after Lucy, my dear friend. Dear Lord, look after my friend. of the North Tower of the Bastille. Listen to me, listen! Listen! God! Manette is my name. Doctor once in Beauvais. Prisoner in the North Tower more years than I could count. Listen! My son-in-law has been taken to La Force. He came to do good here. Evermore gave away all he owned, all his land, his home, the farms and the cottages, all given back to the people many years ago. He is taken and held in secret. Help for the Bastille prisoner! The old man with his flowing white hair and white beard led them shoulder to shoulder, hand on shoulder. In the courtyard, one man, so besmeared he might have been sorely wounded, lay by the side of the grindstone and looked about him for a moment vacantly. The great grindstone earth turned once more, and the sun was red on the courtyard. And on the lesser grindstone, red that the sun had never given and would never take away. Jerry! The ladies are settled, sir. Uh, quite settled, but crying, sir. A dilemma, Jerry. A dilemma. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, do anything, you understand? Such old and dear friends, but what to do? Sir? Can't stay here. Not good at all. Telson's has a... Well, we are a business house, and I cannot, cannot allow friendship and business to mix. Have to find a place for them to stay. A safe place, Mr. Lorry. Mm. It's a wicked, ugly place, sir. Always knew it. For him pass, not for Jerry Caruncher. Not for decent folk. No. Nor for me, sir. Nor them ladies. Defarge, perhaps. Go and see him. Ask him for help. Ask him for... Well, uh, safety. Tomorrow morning, go to his wine shop. Yeah. Uh, where is it, Mr. Lorry? Saint Antoine. Oh, that's a stew, sir. Hmm? This wild men, sir, and women, for the matter of that. Not trust my own wife there, sir, and her flopping and her praying fit to bust. It's no go, sir. So? Where? Mr. Lorry, is there news of my father? I'm sure he is safe. A prisoner from the Bastille is something of a saint here. He will not be touched. And if any man can find and help Charles, it is Dr. Manette. You must be patient. Patient, is it? My poor darling hardly slept. Oh, now, now, Bross, we must trust Mr. Lorry. Mm. If you could but spare the time to find us rooms. This very morning. Uh, Jerry? Jerry? Oh, I'm sure I don't know what will become of us, Mr. Cruncher. Uh, there's savages for certain, but nothing will come to you while they know you're the old man's family. Well, I told my little darling we should have stayed. Should have stayed in London. Quiet, no good comes of mixing with foreign folk. No, no one understands plain English, no one. How's a body to shop or keep body and soul together? Uh, you'll find a way. You've got a place, you've got Mr. Laurie looking on you. You've got me standing in the door to turn away undesirables. Well. Now, Miss Pross, uh, dinner. There's a market down the street will suit. Food and drink in there. You've got money. 
Oh, Mr. Lorry has been most kind. Uh, so he should, seeing he's got a whole bag to call on. Very well. We'll go a shopping, Miss Pross. <laughs> More wine. More wine, citizen. Hold your noise, citizen, and let us have some peace. More wine, I say. And I say, hold your noise, or maybe you'd like to face a tribunal. How? Why? I've done my duty. You, citizen, make a lot of noise and do little. You shout from the back and we do the work, citizen. So hold your noise. Tell him. Tell him, citizeness. We're equal here, friend. Hold your noise. Good morning, citizeness. Is Jacques at home? Oh, you. We had you down for what you are. I do my duty, madame. You informed on us, Englishman. I assure you, citizeness, I did no such thing. I'm here from the committee. I'm as good a patriot as you. An Englishman? Maybe in England, in time, we'll lose our king. You set an example. Oh, we'll set examples that'll shake them in their shoes, friend. We'll have the cuppy's head in the basket. We'll show the way. What do you want with my husband? To tell him there are people he might like to see come to Paris. Tell me. The wife and child of Evremont. Looking for him. An old man came to the committee last night. 105 North T Tower, he said. He too wanted to find Evremont to release him from La Fosse. His wife? Yes. And child? Yes. Oh. Done. Another day done. Dear God, I'm so tired. I must go and smile at Lucy. Kiss the child, tell stories, fill their time. I am so tired. Yes? Lottie? Jarvis Lottie? The bank is shut, sir, for the day. Do I look as if I have money to put in banks, Mr. Lottie? Then why... Do you know me? Do you know me? I... I have seen you somewhere. If you'd step into the light... Perhaps at my wine shop. You're... Monsieur Defarge, who I remember. You come from Dr. Manette? Citizen Defarge, yes, I come from Dr. Manette. Well, what does he say? Where is he? What does he send me? This. Hmm? Charles, Charles is, safe. is safe. I cannot safely leave this place yet. I have obtained the favour that the bearer has a short note from Charles to his wife. Let the bearer see his wife. It's from La Force. Less than an hour since. Well, come. Two women in the courtyard, sitting by the grindstone, one knitting. Madame Defarge, surely. I remember you, madame, for the last time we met, oh, 17 years ago. Even then, you were knitting. Yes. Does madame go with us? Yes. Oh, I see. She goes, and La Vengeance goes also, so that they may be able to recognize the faces and know the persons. It is for their safety. That's it, Englishman. For their safety. To recognize their faces, to know the persons. Yes. Take us to the emigrant's wife, sir. Mr. Lorry, Mr. Lorry, I don't understand. These people, who are they? Where is my father? Is he... Safe. He has seen Charles. There is a note from him. Oh, let me see it. Let, let me see it. Yeah. I knew your father well. I was his servant for many years. No servants now, Defarge. Give her the letter if you must, and we can go. No, please. Uh, you will take tea, some wine? No. Here. Dearest, yes, it is his aunt. Take courage. I am well, and your father has influence around me. You cannot answer this. Kiss the child for me. Oh, Charles. Charles. Madam, I cannot thank you enough. She's read it. I will know her. It's finished, husband. We can go. 
But I, I don't understand. Know me. Why, why should you know me? My dear, there are frequent risings in the streets. It's unlikely they will ever trouble you, but Madame Defarge wishes to see those whom she has the power to protect at such times. I believe I state the case, Citizen Defarge. Yes. We may go. Lucy, the child. Have the child here and the good Pross. Y yes, of course, yes. Uh, Pross? Pross, bring Lucy. Our Pross, Defarge, is an English lady and knows no French. Pross appeared in the doorway, carrying the dear child. A match for any foreigner, not shaken by distress or danger. She handed the child to Lucy and faced Madame Defarge. Well, bold face. I hope you are pretty well, bold face. Is that his child? She stopped her work and pointed with her knitting needle at little Lucy, as if it were the finger of fate. Uh, uh, yes, madame, this is our poor prisoner's darling daughter and only child. We shall know her. It is enough, husband. I have seen them. But, madame, will you help? You will be good to my poor husband. Your husband is not my business here. It is the safety of your father that is my business here. Then for his sake be merciful to my husband. For my child's sake. She will put her hands together and pray you to be merciful. We are more afraid of you than of these others. What is it that your husband says in that letter? Influence, he says? Something touching influence? Uh, that my father... My father has much influence around him. Then let it release your husband. The far as we may go. Please! As a wife and mother, I implore you, have pity on me. Think of me as a wife and mother. The wives and mothers we have been used to see since we were little as this child, and much less, have not been greatly considered. We have known their husbands and fathers laid in prison and kept from them often enough. All our lives we have seen women suffer in themselves, in their children, poverty, nakedness, hunger, thirst, sickness, misery, oppression, and neglect of all kinds. Nothing else. Nothing. We have borne this a long time. Judge, is it likely that the trouble of one wife and mother would be much to us now? Come. <laughs> courage, Lucy, courage. Think. We have found him. Your father is safe. Courage. That dreadful woman seems to throw a shadow on me. And all my hopes. And the shadow is dark indeed. My friend, the doctor, did not return to us until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. When I left you, dear friend, and went into the crowd, <laughs> they took me to the prison of La Force to a scene of carnage. Charnel house of bodies in the streets. And to the prison, there a tribunal sat where the prisoners were brought singly and set forth to be massacred or to be released in a few cases or back to their cells. I was brought in by the crowd and taken to the bench where the tribunal sat, half drunk, some asleep, and all with blood on their hands. Name? His name is Manic! His name is 105 North Tower! 100 and... Who are you? I am 105 from the North Tower of the Bastille. <laughs> we will hear him. We will hear him speak. Your profession? Prisoner. 18 years in secret and unaccused. My name, Manette Doctor. You say? Why would we believe you? I know the man. His name is Manette, Doctor of Beauvais. I know him. Hear him, man. Listen to the secret prisoner. Hear him, man. Hear him, brother. Well, there is a man here in La Force, secretly. Ah, there are many. Aristos, emigrants, oppressors. No, my son-in-law, my family, he's here. His name is Evermond. Come here to help an old servant. Yes, he came knowing the danger. That servant had done all he asked and given away his lands, his farms, his rents, his debts, freed his peasants from their burdens many years ago. 
this man you have held here. A good man, an honest man, a man of honor. Maybe we have him. I want him freed to return to his wife and child. No. If you can find him in the register, we'll talk again. I looked then with a sinking heart at the ledgers on the table. So many struck through, so much blood. And while I looked and looked, the tribunal sent more to La Guillotine. And the mob howled and rejoiced and... Please, please, mm. friend, you distress yourself. I found his name at last in a separate list. Secret, written by his name. Here, 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 here citizen president, it is here. Very well. We give our word that while he remains in custody, he shall for your sake be kept safe. I want him free. He stays with us. You have our word. In the name of liberty, equality and fraternity, you have our word. Manette, you have done wonders. No, no. Charles is alive. He is safe. But not released. We can work for that. You may work for that. You can see him? Yes, but not Lucy. Not his child. It would be more than they could bear. 105, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Stand back from the door. You're afraid I'll run away? A visitor inside. I will knock when your time is up, old man. I heard you counting. I was walking. I imagined a walk we used to take in London. Lucy and... Father, how is she? Knowing I see you, she's happier. Please sit down. I imagined our little house in Soho. As I walked, I saw the streets and the trees and her... I know, I know. I have done it, my boy, for... Well, for a long time I did it. Is Lucy well? She's as well as we can expect. She will be well when you're out of here. I'm afraid that may be a long time. We heard they killed the king. Yes, and his wife... In the name of liberty, they say, of equality, fraternity, death. I am put from time to time amongst the other prisoners. I see them waiting, hoping, and then the hope dying. Then their day and their number, and the next morning there is more space at the table, more room by the window. You have a letter from my wife? I am not allowed to bring one. I have messages of love. Tell them. Tell them I love them. Have you heard the latest cure for grey hair? No. La guillotine. Oh. Also excellent for headaches, they say. They say whoever kisses la guillotine sneezes into a sack. They say. Oh, hush, oh, hush. I brought you food and a bottle of wine. They let you? A suitable gift for the jailer, and he's friendly enough. Outside! Hmm. Stand back from the door, prisoner everyone. We're ready. You'll be free soon. Now give me a kiss for dear Lucy. And a kiss for the child. Farewell. The year one of liberty, and the deluge rising from below, not falling from above, with the windows of heaven shut, not opened. The executioner showed the head of the king to the crowd, and now, after eight months of weary widowhood, the head of his fair wife turned grey. The terror and its engine sheared off heads that the ground beneath was polluted, rotten red. Through all these terrors, Dr. Manette walked and talked and never doubted he would save Lucy's husband. A year and three months he lay confined, and still the doctor believed. 
The lines of dead, roped together, found in rivers in the south. Prisoners shot in squares in dusty towns, and still the doctor walked through the prisons, working to save a life here, a life there, easing one and another to a kinder death. A man apart. Not suspected, nor brought to question. He told Lucy where she might walk from time to time, and her husband might catch a glimpse of her from a certain window at that time. It was a cruel time. Stealing unseen to west with this disgrace. Even so, my son, one early morn did shine, with all triumphant splendor on my brow. But out of luck, he was but one hour mine. Lucy, please go on. I'm sorry, Mr. Laurier. I don't seem able to, I'm sorry. She's tired, Mr. Lorry. We've had a busy day of it. <laughs> and I can tell you I'll be glad never to see another Froggy as long as I live, sir. Miss Pross, there are good and bad everywhere, surely. Oh, not here. I was only saying to your man, Jerry, uh, Mr. Cruncher, this very morning, what I'd give for a look at the Thames and, and the streets round our little corner in Golden Square. Oh, what I wouldn't give to go into the market and hear good English voices calling and shouting. He agreed with me. He is missing Mrs. Cruncher. Yes, well, be that as it may, he, he's worried about his work. His work? He is being paid, Miss Pross. Oh, he has other business, I think. Oh, he's very close, is Mr. Cruncher. I, I can't abide prying, and I don't, I assure you, pry, nor never have, but... Oh, time spent here is time ill spent. We'll go as soon as Charles is free. My father is sure of it. I am sure of it. So, it will not be long, Pross, dear, surely? No. No, not long. <laughs> Good night, dear Pross. Good night, my precious. Good night, Mr. Lorry. Good night, my dear. Yeah, I must go home. It's not safe to be on the street too late, even with Jerry as a guardian angel. It won't do. It will not do, Mr. Lorry. I assure you it will not do. I beg your pardon? Free him. Free him soon. They're a murdering mob. Want nothing better than to take his head. Oh, Miss Pross. You think I don't see? You think Mr. Cruncher and I don't know? He goes from time to time. Mr. Cruncher goes to the square and watches... He comes back fuming angry. Waste, he mutters. Waste to take their heads off, he says. W when we see them in their carts, timbrils, whatever. Tumbrils. Yes, well, see them jolting through the streets, filled with lovely girls. Bright women, brown-haired, black-haired, grey, young men, old men, common and gentle-born. You know what they call them, Mr. Lorry? They say, red wine for la guillotine. It's true. I know. I do know. You think my precious don't know? Near enough a year and a half now. Oh, her father says nothing can happen to him without my knowledge. He believes it. And she tries to. She puts his book out every evening and the chair by the fire and a pipe and glass ready for him for, for when he comes out of the prison. Oh, she's cheating herself, Mr. Lorry. And I am afraid for her. I think we are all afraid for her, dear Pross. You're sure, Father? Sometimes Charles can get near the upper window I showed you at three in the afternoon. Now, if he can get there, and sometimes he'll not be able, he might see you in the street. If I stand in that place you showed me? Yes, but you'll not be able to see him, my poor child. And even if you could, it would be unsafe to make a sign of recognition, you understand. Show me the place again, and I will go there every day. And every day from that time, in all weathers, I stand for two hours. As the clock strikes two. For two hours. Good day, Citizen S. At the end of the dark and dirty street where I stand is the hovel of a cutter of wood. Good day, Citizen. Walking here again, Citizen S. As you see, Citizen. But it's not my business. And the child. Yes, my child. It's not my business. My work. 
It's my business. See my saw, little one? I call it my little guillotine. <laughs> and off his head comes. I call myself the Samson of the firewood guillotine. See? Again, off her head comes. And a little one, a child. Pickle, 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 and off its head comes <laughs> all the family. But it's not my business. Charles saw her once in four or five times. Her father told her, and it made it worthwhile. She was always afraid of the woodcutter, but pressed a little money in his hand, and he left her to her own devices. Until one day in December, when the snow was likely falling, and a throng of people came pouring round the corner by the prison wall. He was there, hand in hand, with La Vengeance. The woodman and 500 or more, like 5,000 or more demons. The men and women danced together, the women danced together and the men together. A mere storm at first of coarse red caps and coarse woolen rags. And then they began to dance around Lucy, cowering in the street. Advance, retreat, spun around and around, hands linked, chains of them dancing till they dropped. And then again, dancing, they struck and clawed, clutched and tore, and as suddenly swooped, screaming off. Oh, Lucy, my child. Oh, Father, what have I seen? Such a cruel bad son. I know, I know, my dear. I, I've seen it many times, and don't be frightened. Not one of them would harm you. I'm not frightened for myself, Father. But when I think of Charles, and of the mercies of these people... Now, look. Look towards the window. There's uh, no one to see you. Now, kiss your hand towards it. He will see you. Oh, if only I could see him. Good afternoon, <laughs> citizeness. Good afternoon, Madame Defarge. I, I was walking with my father. Yes. To be sure, walking with your father. Good day, citizeness. Lucy. Oh, she saw. Oh, I'm afraid of her father. There's no need. The time has come. Father? Tomorrow. What tomorrow? The tribunal. He's summoned for the morrow. I've heard it from... Well, no matter where from. Now, we need to go home. I need to prepare to be sure. You're not afraid. I trust you. Will you take more wine, Mr. Carden? Thank you, no, Mr. Lorry. I cannot tell you what a surprise it has been to see you here. To be honest, Mr. Lorry, I miss my Sunday evenings. How do they do in this dreadful place? Oh, the doctor does all he can to keep her spirits high. He sees Charles daily in the prison. He works to bring his trial forward. It seems Charles Downey's life revolves around trials, Mr. Lorry. At least in England he had a judge and jury and defence. Here, well, it is an affront to justice. The tribunal send men, women and children to their deaths as easily as you take snuff. I have observed them already. Why did you come to Paris? I told you, sir, I was bored in London. Dull, no Sunday evenings with old friends. No sight of the little child. I am fond, as you know very well, Mr. Lorry. Yes. Yes, I know, Mr. Carton. She is not to know I am here, if you please. As you wish. Thank you. So, tomorrow, the tribunal. Shall you be there? Oh, I shall be there. This is what they call a court, eh? <laughs> no, bail it is. A ragbag of men and women in red hats and dirty coats. Like as if the populace of half the prisons in London was coming to be judge and jury. Another then for the blade. Snap your fingers and there's another scent. Such a waste of goods as I never saw. A corner of the market that set a man up for his life. Be hardship of matching head in cadaver, I grant ya. I swear, they've sent so many down they hardly ever look up. 
They laugh a lot at the miserable wretches who come blinking up into the light from their cells. The men are armed. The women eat and drink and knit as often as not. Hey, there's that woman has come to see Miss Lucy and knitting away at a gavin with her husband. Uh, they fired, it was. Yeah. And nearby him, Dr. Manette, a popular man for the doctoring he's done for half the stinking mob here. And alongside him is Mr. Lorry looking... Well, as you'd expect a man of his years to look in such a place. Charles Evremont Cordani. Evremont! Hey! Enemy of the people! Enemy of the Republic! You are Charles Evremont. I am. You are accused of being an emigrant. Your life is forfeit under the decree that banished all emigrants on pain of death. That decree was made... No after... matter to us when the date was put to the decree. You stand there. The decree lies on this table. Your head shall drop into the bath. You have lived many years in England? Yes. I gave up voluntarily a title that was distasteful to me, a position that was distasteful to me, and left before the present use of the word emigrant was in use. I went to live by my own industry in England rather than on the industry of the overladen people of France. Proof? Two witnesses, Théophile Gabel and Alexander Manette. You are married in England? True but not to an Englishwoman, to a citizeness of France. By birth? Yes. Her name and family? Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits here in this tribunal. They like the old man for his kindness, and plenty here have good reason. They're a-turning to our man now. He might even miss the blade like he slipped the rope. Why did you return to France? I was asked to, begged to, by my first witness. You have his letter before you. Théophile Gabel needed my help to get out of prison. I came to save him, sir, and to bear my testimony to his innocence. To the truth. Is that criminal in the eyes of the Republic? <laughs> Gabel is here? Here? Yes, he is there. And he tells the tribunal what he wants to hear. If the stinking dogs on the benches are anything to go by. And then the doctor stands before him and, well, no doubt he says things that soothe even the savages around me. Charles Darnay was my first friend after coming out of the prison of the Bastille. The accused has remained in England and devoted himself to me, and later to my daughter. No friend of the aristocrat government there, he was tried for his life by it. Whoa. Tried as a foe of England, and friend of the United States who have been so warm in their friendship to the Republic. This man is a gentleman who gave up land and rents and released men and women of debts they could never pay. A man, in short, of the people! <laughs> this trial in England... I have another witness to it, sir. Monsieur Lorry, an English gentleman here present with me. He can corroborate what I have told you. Yes. <laughs> Jury! Jury! You have to decide... Not guilty. Not guilty. Look at them all. One minute they want to shed blood, the next they're shedding tears of joy. He's buried there under fraternal embraces from men and women who had gladly locked his head off five minutes ago. I believe the next to stand in his place will have a short time of it on his earth. He'll make up for one freed on the next poor devil. Lift a finger in the prison. Sign for death. Long live the Republic.
I'll go ahead and warn Lucy to expect you. You were superb, my friend. And you are kind. Lucy, my own. I, I have prayed, dearest Charles, how I have prayed for. I am safe. Let me thank God on my knees for it. And we all bowed our heads and hearts for a moment, and then she was in his arms again. Dearest, no other man in all France could have done what your father has done for me. Hush, now it is done. He's saved. You'll need all your strength now, child. <laughs> and outside in the street... The shadows of the wintry afternoon were beginning to fall. A shadow passed over Lucy as she stood in his arms, as if... as if in hearing the dreadful carts rolling through the streets, she heard echoes and saw shadows of her dear husband among the condemned. Waiting by the door to shed a tear on her precious, Miss Pross was dressed to go out to purchase the few things this frugal family needed for their evening meal. Miss Pross and Mr. Cruncher discharged the office of purveyors, the former carrying the money, the latter the basket. Now, Mr. Cruncher, if you are ready, I am. At your service, Miss Pete. Now, don't forget the wine, Miss Pross. We have something to celebrate. <laughs> you will stay for the evening, Mr. Lorry. Oh, thank you. I had hoped to be asked. Miss Pross, <laughs> Mr. Lorry will be staying. Very well. Very well indeed. Cheese, Mr. Cruncher. Cheese. Wine, Mr. Cruncher. Wine. And bread. Mr. Cruncher. Brave. Uh, pray, pray be cautious. Yes, yes, I'll be cautious. I tell Mr. Cruncher here, you can look about any street here and in any shop and see them as sup with the devil nightly. <laughs> Midnight murder and mischief. But I may say among ourselves that I do hope there will be no oniony and tobacco-y smotherings in the form of embraces all round going on in the streets. Oh, Miss Pross, should there be, don't look. <laughs> I do not look, sir. They force themselves under the eye of anyone passing. May I ask a question, Dr. Manet? Before I go. I think you may take that liberty. Oh, for gracious sake, don't talk about liberty. We have quite enough of that. The long and the short of it is that I am a subject of his most gracious majesty, King George the Third, And as such, my maxim is confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks. On or him, him our ropes, ropes we fix. fix. God, God save the king. king. Oh. Why, <laughs> Mr. Cruncher, sir, I am glad, sir, you're that much of an Englishman, even if you do have that cold in your voice. <laughs> My question, Dr. Manette, is, yep. is there any prospect yet of our getting out of this place? Uh, I fear not yet. It would be dangerous for Charles to leave yet. Oh, well, no matter. We must have patience and wait, that's all. We must hold up our heads and fight low, as my dear brother Solomon used to say. <laughs> now then, Mr. Cruncher, cheese, wine, bread, and go come along, sir. I left for the bank leaving Lucy, her husband, her father, and the child by the bright fire. Little Lucy held her grandfather's hand as he began to tell her of a great and powerful fairy who had opened a prison wall and let out a captive. I left them very peaceful. And the walls fell around the people, and outside was light. And the poor men and ladies inside the prison walked out into the light. There, Lucy. Mm. Father, what's that noise outside? Mm. Oh, it's nothing, nothing, my dear. I think she's a little overwrought, Charles. Perhaps you should lie down. No, I heard. There's someone on the stair. I heard them. And not the staircases. as still as death. Oh, no, Father. Mm. Hi, Charles. Hide yourself. Father, then save my, my him. My child, I have saved him. I'll go to the door now. Don't give way, child. Yes? The citizen Evremont called down, eh? Who wants him? I want him. We want him. He's in there, isn't he? You can't walk this into... This is state business, old man. Lucy, hush now. 
What is it? I know you. I was at the tribunal. Everyone, you are again a prisoner of the Republic. Oh, what? No, Father, no! Why am I taken again? You can come straight to the conciergerie. You are now all tomorrow. You are some and full tomorrow. Do you know me? Yes, I know you, citizen doctor. We all know you, citizen. Will you answer his question to me? Why is he taken again? He is accused by Saint Antoine. That's enough, citizen. Of what? Ask no more. If the Republic demands sacrifices from you without doubt, as a good patriot, you will make them. The Republic goes before all. The people is supreme. Every man, we are pressed. But who denounced him? Tell me. It is against the rule. It's against the rule. But he is denounced, and gravely. But who by? By the citizen and citizen Estefage. Huh? And by one other. What other? Do you ask, citizen doctor? Yes, who? You will be answered tomorrow. Yes. Now you, come with us. Oh. Oh.